Hello, and welcome to the Path of Most Persistence. This is a place where we hear and share tenacious stories of overcoming obstacles with our partners who dare to share a bit of their own personal paths. Nicole Popberg has a unique role as Executive Director for Texas A&M Engineering, Human Resources, and Payroll. She has tremendous experience focusing on employee relations, compliance, rural interpretation, staffing data, and employment development. She leads and supports employee wellness initiatives and other beneficial resources for the entire staff. Nicole, thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. It is so wonderful to have someone in your position talk with us. Um, You have a very diverse portfolio, I believe, Um, but not only with your current position, but just you as an individual. So I hope you don't mind. Uh, Just to begin, I'd love for you just to share a little bit with me and our audience. Tell us about your position. Can you just tell us about maybe some of your responsibilities and what you do day to day? I would love to. It's it's my dream job for sure. I I am blessed to be um, surrounded by a, a fantastic team. And we are small but mighty. We support the entire enterprise, College of Engineering and TEAS, and we do it um, through team effort. My job is to um, support them, to support my team. Speak a moment about maybe how I I got to that. Um, Part of my job I do like the best is the employee relations. Sounds odd that you'd want to take on conflict, but it's the it's the end that we see at the end of that discussion where we're able to solve a problem. So the solving problem is, is what, what we all do in HR and payroll. It, there has to be a balance because you do take uh, joy. There is a, a certain amount of satisfaction that comes along with that, but there has to be uh, difficulties in managing the difficult situations. It can't mm-hmm. all just be um, pleasant all the time. How do you manage that along with all the demands? Because it seems as though the role you have with human resources and payrolls, there's so much attention to detail. So how do you manage the joy, the responsibilities, and also those uncomfortable moments of dealing with really difficult issues? How, do, how does that work? Uh, great question. Um, so I manage through um, managing my stress as a first and foremost through collaboration, talking with others, bringing in other ideas. There's no one person that has all the right ideas or answers to any situation, so very much of collaborative effort. And um, just going back to what I, what I have been trained, and that is to um, back it up with policy, back it up with uh, fact, and to um, sometimes you have to take the person out of the situation Mm -hmm. and what is the best business decision. So as the executive director, that uh, to many people is um, such a high profile position. It has lots of responsibilities. It uh, carries a lot of weight. How did you get there? What is your story? If you don't mind, let's go back. I mean, if I were to display your resume, your CV uh, in front of our audience today, what would that look like? Can you talk about how you got there? I want to know about you going back to early young Nicole. Oh, sure. So my entire career has been with A&M Engineering. That's that's pretty rare. It's been in many different positions and places, but it's... It's an honor to say that my entire career thus far has been with engineering. Mm. I started um, 34 years ago in mechanical engineering. My my claim to fame in mechanical is I was the only staff person with a Macintosh computer. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody knew how to help me. Um, Nobody knew how to even turn it on. Um, So I taught myself. Um, Back then, we didn't have IT support Mm. help desk. We didn't have... Um, Slack teams. It was just the old-fashioned way. So it was a a very humble start. Um, I then had the opportunity to work for several years in the vice chancellor and dean's office. Mm -hmm. I had some amazing, amazing uh, leaders to work with, like Herb Richardson and Carl Erdman and 
um, Penny Beaumont, and I had a lot of different roles while I worked in the vice chancellor's office. That was for about 15 years, mm-hmm. and I think that's where I learned. Um, I learned to respect um, the position that you're given and the positions that you could strive for. There's never I'm, there's never been a sense of entitlement. Mm-hmm. It's working really hard, working and learning and um, gaining respect and that's how I was able to have so many opportunities. Um, I then had um, a wonderful chance to move over to the uh, Human Resources Office, and that was kind of like a a redo, a start over. Mm -hmm. I was not trained as a human resource individual specialist. I didn't know all of the terminology. Um, So my first task was to do our affirmative action plan Mm -hmm. and figure out how that works. And then I had the, the joy of diving into the rules and policies. Um, so in through all of that, I was able to kind of kind of just gauge my career and gain my career in a way that I could help with processes, help with efficiencies and things like that. So what do you think your leaders, your supervisors saw in you that they provided you opportunities to make those types of pivots. Mm -hmm. What did they see? What is it about you, do you think, and those qualities that you have? I I would say they see that I'm a team player. Um, And I kind of want to give you a a story about that. Please. Um, I grew up in rural Kansas, tiny, tiny town, farming community. Um, parents were not farmers, but you're just engaged in that. Such a small town. My high school graduating class was 24, 24 people. And so you had to do everything. You had to be a team player, um, even if it wasn't something that was your passion. So I was on track. They had a spot to be a high jumper. I'm 5'2". Took one for the team, became a high jumper so that the, the fast ones could run the race. That kind, of, that kind of built me. You put aside yourself and you do what needs to be done for the good of the team, for the good of the organization, you do it. I love that. And that is such a noble way of looking at things, but that has to be intentional too because I think there are some of us that that may come naturally to, uh, some not so much, but even those that have that natural tendency um, it's not always easy. It's not. So how do you maintain? How do you persist through the demands of what you do, working with all the different types of leaderships and staffing issues and, and personalities? How do you maintain all of that, Nicole? It's important to have self-care routine. I, I strongly believe in that. Um, I think, too, you have to... Um, I'm going to go back to putting yourself aside. Um, don't don't get so caught up in the details that you lose sight of the big picture. And how I maintain that, um, I, I'm a runner. Um, I do yoga. I I like to um, engage other people when needed, um, and I want to build those respectful relationships so that we can work together. Okay because I just recently found out, and you just recently mentioned that you're a runner. I want to talk about that because I have a great appreciation for running and runners. Why do you run? I should, full disclosure, I actually broke up with running in (laughs) September, so it's still kind of a new hurt. Listen, we'll have a counseling (laughs) session. I too broke up with running about a year or two ago, so I understand the struggle. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about our past love, our past relationship Mm -hmm. with running. Let's talk about it. This is a safe place. So what running did for me, um, it's, it was my way to clear my head, to have that conversation with somebody, that really crucial, difficult conversation with someone in your head. Um, you could talk through things. It's when I did my best strategy work. It's mm-hmm. when I um, would just map out a process, make it more efficient. It was my my soul work. I also built, built friendships through running and um, people that I've now been friends with for 20 plus years. And so running for me was 
is was very therapeutic. Um, it was my choice to break up. I broke up with running. Let's make that it was very you clear. not. I was in control. Running. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we go a step further into running, do you want to talk about why you broke up with running? I was. I'm old. <laughs> I'm getting older. <laughs> I was. I was hurt most of the time, mm-hmm. hips, that kind of thing, and <clears throat> instead of running less and doing some other workouts, I was only running a tiny bit and doing nothing else. Yes. So um, I, I tend to be one of those people when we go on vacation, my family will say, <clears throat> I think you need to go work out because yeah. I get a little tense. And so I wasn't having that mental release anymore. Yes. So I needed to find another way, another way to work out that was healthy for me. Nice. Okay, so just because I think for those that do run and those that do not run, I want to talk about what does that look like when you talk about what running did for you, gave you an opportunity, it cleared your mind, it allowed you for creativity. What is it about? Is it about running? Is it that time alone? Is it the release of something? Is it the breathlessness of it? What is is it for you? It was all of that for yes. sure. I was an early morning runner. Mm-hmm. My favorite part of the day is when that sun is just starting to come up and the world's starting to wake up and you've been up for an hour already, p- pounding the pavement by yourself yes. with your friends, whatever. That's my favorite part of the day. And what running did for me was just, it, it let me just calm myself down. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. And I think for many runners and just for that part of myself, I think it was such um, uh, an example, a pathway of how to live Mm -hmm. my life because in the struggles of whatever it was, if it was something that was professional or personal or emotional, spiritual, it allowed for a good example because if I could just take that one more step, Mm -hmm. the next step would follow. Mm -hmm. And when I felt breathless, I knew another breath would follow if I just released myself. It was a lot about releasing, giving in to whatever came at you or whatever you stepped into. So I'm wondering if that was something you experienced as well. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, they... They talk about a runner's high, yes. and that's a, that is a real thing for it sure. Um, yes. Another thing that running did for me was um, there's a sense of accountability. Mm-hmm. Um, back to my dad to- to- always said to me, finish what you start. Yes. If I signed up for a race, I was going to train for and run that race. So you really think hard about what you're going to commit to. Um, if you say to your friends, yes, I'll run 18 miles with you at 430 yes. on a Friday morning. Yes you are gonna show up. Um, and so the accountability of it was just a big part of what I, what I enjoyed, what shaped me, I think what made me keep doing it for so many years. So what of all the races that you entered in, which one did you gain the most from, or maybe enjoyed mm-hmm. the most, but that's a, yeah. an interesting word when you're running. <laughs> and then which one did you, um, suffer the most. And I mean suffer because it's not only physical, there's other aspects to it. So sure. can you talk about those? Oh, absolutely. So um, first first marathon was in Austin, Texas. It was in February. It was very chilly. And the group of friends that I trained with, we were standing there. Marathons are generally on a Sunday. And my friend looked at me and she said, look at all of these people. There are thousands of people showing up on a Sunday to do something healthy. And uh, it was just, that was the start of my, my first marathon. It was hard. It was a hard run. It's a very hilly in Austin. And my husband, um, not a runner at all, he was at miles 3, 6, 9, 12, and then the end. Mm. So he, he had to really hoof it to get yes. to all those points. And I got to the end. I had about a, maybe a half of a mile left. And it was so cold and starting to get rainy. And... He, I'll never forget, he took off his sweatshirt, gave it to me, and let me cross the finish line warm. Yeah. What did that mean for you? The fact that he detests running <laughs> so supported me, it, it was beautiful. That is beautiful because that was so selfless. 
of him to help you in that way. That's beautiful. I love that. And since the breakup is still <laughs> tender and fresh with running, what are you doing uh, in place of or in lieu of that release mm-hmm. or that creative well, space? Well, I, I started my, my role as executive director of HR and payroll in September, September 1, broke up with running towards the end of September. So thankfully, my job has filled that void. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have, um, I've gone back to just, um, yoga and, um, some pure cardio and strength training and got it in my head that you don't have to work out every single day and that's okay to give yourself grace. That's okay. And that's a, a beautiful way of looking at life and even perhaps even the different chapters of our professionalism, Mm -hmm. because we have to adapt with each new chapter if it's not just the physical way of releasing, but the intellectual part of that as well. And with this new role, I'm wondering what have you learned most from your staff and what do you intentionally try to teach your staff? That's such a good question. Um, So I met with each one of them individually. Um, We had a chat with Nick session. And one thing that came out that um, really good advice from Randy Shirley, he said, always work towards gaining and keeping the respect of the people you work with. And so that's, that's been a lot of my focus right now. That's beautiful. And I'm sure uh, that is uh, very much felt within your staff. If there is, uh, are there any major projects that you're working on, any major initiatives that maybe perhaps you'd like to talk about to get more attention? Absolutely. We, in 2020, March of 2020, when we went on spring break, we came back and then went remote for almost a year plus. Um, we started looking at what would it be like to have a hybrid work model? What, mm-hmm. what does that look like for our organization? Would it even work? And so we, we did a lot of research. I led a task force that looked into that. Um, then we put it on pause because we did not want that to be in, in response to a pandemic. Um, we had a, a situation recently where there was a true business need to have some people work not in the office full time. It was a space a space need. Mm-hmm. And so we were able to launch all the work that the task force had done as a pilot. And that's been an exciting initiative. Still somewhat in the pilot stages, but we're learning a lot about what may and may not work, what kind of positions might might be best suited for that, what kind of personalities might be best suited for that. And so it's just been a very rewarding project to see it from its very first tiny little thought to now we're we're piloting it we're trying it out so that's been a a big project and we have some other big ones we we uh, onboard um, and hire help hire all of the employees we have two hire dates a month and as you can imagine the start of the semester is our busy time and so we're always looking at how can we make that process more efficient? How might we make that better for the new employee? We want them to come in feeling engaged and knowing what our enterprise is about, but how can we make that transition to their their job just seamless and, and easy for them? So that's always an effort that our task, our staff works on. That's really great to hear. And I'm, I'm really curious, again, being in your current chair and all your experience, For those listening, young and old, experienced and not so experienced, what are the traits that are really valuable when you're looking at a new hire? Um, And also maybe some recommendations for those that are looking to enter the workforce or maybe looking for a new position. What should they be working toward or maybe avoiding? That is a good question. Um, Traits, I would say, um, well, for one, be genuine. Skills can be taught. We can teach people most any skill they need. A good example, we hired um, an individual to focus solely on our immigration and Form I-9 compliance. And as part of that interview process, we had a, 
a series of forms we put in front of this member and said, please pick up the Form I-9. We were hiring her to be our Form I-9 specialist. Pick up the Form I-9 and um, let's talk about it. She chose the wrong form. She didn't know what it was. She is like my rock star employee. She's she's she learns she yeah. so you have to look past some of those things yes. and sometimes hire for um, best fit and and the best personality and teach those skills work really hard at teaching those skills that's important and and for those young people I know with so much of our effort with our outreach programs especially the ones that target k-12 our young people are sometimes at a at a, maybe a lack of awareness of how they're presenting themselves to the world and what uh, perhaps they're putting on paper or what they're putting out in social media. So do you have any recommendations for those maybe prospective um, employees or ones that you just like to give some advice that maybe what they shouldn't be <laughs> posting, how they should be presenting themselves to the world? I actually love that you asked this question. Um, <laughs> Kind of the way that I got to where I am, again, is I, I worked hard, I was afforded opportunities, I made opportunities for myself, and what I would advise new people is do not have that sense of entitlement. You need to work, you need to work for it, and I feel like I've seen that a lot lately, it kind of bothers me, um, so look to your mentors, you know, learn from people ask questions, be open-minded. That is important um, and a very important point. But for those that don't even realize they're entitled, what does that look like to you? When, because if you're entitled, you don't, mm -hmm. perhaps, you don't even realize it because that is your existence. Mm -hmm. So as a person on the other side of the desk or the other side of the screen, mm -hmm. what, how does that come across to you? What does entitlement look like to you? So um, an example I'll, mm -hmm. I'll share with you. Um, my daughter, <laughs> she, <laughs> I love her, but she can be sometimes drama. Her, the way that she shows entitlement mm -hmm. is she thinks that every single thing is about her. Yes, yes. When she got out of college and got her first job, she called me furious. She said, can you believe how much money they took out of my check to pay taxes? <laughs> And, you know, so I think it's just that reality check sometimes yes. they need to have. And I think that is, thank you, that's a prime example that many of us have had with our own children, no <laughs> doubt. But I think that is so important that they're hearing that from not only their parents, but the adults around them, because sometimes if they don't hear how normal that is, it's just that's what life looks like. That is adulting, as people say now, that that's just part of it. And it's and it goes back towards something. So thank you for pointing that out, because if you don't realize that, uh, if they don't realize they're coming across that way, it's good for them to hear that that's what it looks like, even though I'm sure that was never their intention. And I'm, again, I'm trying to be conscientious of your time, because your time with us is so precious and valuable. I want to know... If there is a message out there, not only to the system, to the staff, but just, I don't know, especially during this time during COVID, of, of one of hope, one of inspiration, is there something that maybe you can say to all of us that we continue to work in a, in a particular direction or in a way to continue our skill set? How, how can you, are there any words of motivation you can provide us, Nicole? When we were uh, remote and we were doing all of our meetings by Zoom, um, we um, said often to one another, give, give each other grace. Mm. And uh, we've carried that back into our office when we've come back full time. And I've, I've asked that of people. I've um, given that to people. I think it's important that you know when you need grace and you know to ask for that. Um, sometimes I'll say to my team, um, my emotional lens today is a little off because, and you know, they know, and it's just, I think we need to give grace. I want to ask you this. Uh, recently we had another very articulate guest that spoke about grace and I asked her this question and I'm going to ask it of you. What is grace to you? 
how do you know when you're in the presence of grace? And how do you know how to give it? What does it look like? I think to give it, you, instead of blaming, you help or you encourage. And sometimes encouraging is not saying it's going to be okay. Sometimes it's saying it's okay to not be okay. Let's talk about the not okay. Um, so I think that's how you can give that. Um, and how do you know when you're in it? Um, I think you feel supported and um, safe. I think you feel safe. Are there any other topics or items you would like to talk about to cover before we begin to close? I would say that um, embrace change and don't be scared of it. We're going through a lot of change in our, um, in our enterprise. We're going through a lot of, in the engineering enterprise, we're going through a lot of change uh, locally, um, globally. I would say find a way to turn those changes to a positive. Very nice. Before we truly come to an end, I want to extend a personal thanks to you. Not so long ago, I personally went through a very difficult time professionally, and you extended such grace and kindness to me that you will forever have a special marker in my heart and in my mind. And you were such a fine example of grace and patience and kindness that I want you to know that you made a difference on that very day, in that very moment. And I don't know if you knew that or if I've ever been able to articulate that to you. But if I haven't sufficiently, um, I hope at some point you feel it and you know it because uh, it meant a lot to me. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So this is something new that I've been doing at the close of okay. our interviews. It's rapid fire. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> let's do it. So I have a few phrases, the beginning of phrases, and I'd like you to finish them. There is no right or wrong answer, just however you'd like. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. You can do this. You're a runner. <laughs> okay, here I'm we go. I'm scared. <laughs> Good scared. Okay, so here we go. I believe in... Kindness. I trust my staff. I love my family. I fear heights. I forgive myself. I want I want chocolate. <laughs> nice. I believe in luck, hard work, or miracles. Hard work. Final one. I persist because I'm worth it. Love it. I mean, what else can you say? Nicole, it was such a privilege to have you here today. Thank you for your valuable time, your knowledge, your wisdom. And uh, I know that everything you said today is going to be of value to not only me uh, and everyone that listens, but definitely our whole entire uh, system. So thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you so much for listening today. I hope you've had the opportunity to listen to the entire conversation and our other conversations as well. And I hope, like Nicole, that we can all give grace to each other and to ourselves. Have a wonderful day.